Uh, good morning, everybody. Great to see everybody. My name is uh, Brian Mosley. I serve as the lead pastor here, and I am thrilled that you guys have come uh, to worship with us here at the Springs, and our prayer is always that uh, you will grow in your relationship with God, and you will begin to take your next steps with Him, and also you'll grow in your relationship with other people, because how many of you know we need right relationships in our lives, okay? Um, um, today we're going to continue a uh, teaching series that I'm calling own the vision. Would you say that with me? Own the vision. Okay, say it like you mean it this time. Own the vision. Now, I'm absolutely thrilled, and I'll go ahead and apologize for the crud I have going on. It's uh, uh, rec uh, recurring uh, um, sinus stuff, so I apologize in advance for that. But I'm absolutely thrilled to be able to share this kind of message with you. Uh, it's a little bit different of a message than I usually share with you, but I'm thrilled because God has given this church a tremendous potential. It's His church, by the way. It's not my church, it's not your church, it's His church. We are His body, and the potential for His church to make a difference in this community is absolutely tremendous. To be all that God wants us to be and to do all that He wants us to do, that's the important thing. And like a, like a loving shepherd, here's what God always does. He always leads us on. He always leads us on to what's next, into our purpose, into our destiny. And sometimes he calls us into areas that are, like Eric was talking about, that are uncomfortable for us. He calls us into areas that stretch us, that make us a little bit uncomfortable so that we will trust in him, but he calls us to make a difference, and he keeps moving us forward. In my constant prayer, as the as a pastor of this church, I've been praying a prayer in Psalms. I want to read it to you. This is uh, in your worship guide, in your notes, if you want to follow along, and it's also up on the screen. It says this: Keep protecting and cherishing your chosen ones, your church, your people. In you, they will never fall. Now look at this next part. Like a shepherd going before us, keep leading us forward. This is what Jesus always does for his people. He keeps leading us forward, forever carrying us in your arms. And that's been my prayer uh, over this last few weeks. And God, I want to know what you're doing. And as a leader of this church, I want to know where you are leading your church Next, and here's a few things that, that the Lord is leading us as a church into, into the coming months. This is not in your notes. This is just for you to know. We have a dream. We have a vision from God to continue to build our dream team. That's why we're taking time during each service to highlight different areas of our church, of our ministry. We believe God is up to something big, and you can be a part of that. So we're building up our dream team. The second goal we have is we want to add a, that second service, as Eric was talking about earlier. We want to reach more people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Third thing is this. We want to continue to multiply our life groups. As I said last week, we have 10 right now. Wouldn't it be amazing next life group semester if we had 15? And then the next semester after that, we had 20. But all, all so that people and families can connect. And begin to study together, to know together, to love together, to support one another in their relationship with God together. The fourth thing is this. We have a heart and a vision to develop a student ministry. Think about a ministry for our middle schoolers and our high schoolers. Think about a Wednesday night filled with teenagers in here worshiping the Lord. Think about the, having the ability to hire a, a youth pastor and, and, and his family. I mean, think about the opportunities to have life groups that are just designed for our teenagers. This is a vision that God has given to us. And, the, and lastly, it's, it's to I, I intensify outreach efforts. We got, we got work to do. We got work to do. We got people to reach. And as long as there are people in our community who do not know the Lord, I'm not going to be content. Like I said last week, I'm grateful for where we are as a church, but I am not content. 
As long as there are people out there who need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, who need to be saved, who need to be delivered, who need to have their marriages restored, who need to have hope in their life and a home in heaven, I'm not going to quit. And I'm not going to be content with where we are. That's why we have to always be allowing Jesus, our good shepherd, to be leading us forward. Amen? He's always leading us forward. Now, you should know these things. You should know these vision items because God might just tap you on the shoulder and say, I want you to help with that. I want you to get involved in this area. I want you to lead a life group. I want you to be a part of that student ministry. I want you to to hug babies in the nurseries. Come on, come on, somebody. I want you to get involved and be a part of the vision that God has for his church. You need to know that. Now, you'll never be able to own the vision if you don't know what it is. If you don't understand what it is. And we try to just communicate this really clear in four different parts. Jot this down if you're taking notes with me. I want you to really understand this. The first part of our vision is we want people to know God. We want people to go beyond a religion, an experience of religion. No, that's not what it's all about. We want people to have a living vibrant, authentic, healthy, growing relationship with God Almighty. Amen? That's, what, that's where it begins. But guess what? God doesn't want you to stop there. I don't want you to stop there. I want you to go into the next part, and that is to find freedom. Find freedom. Freedom. We all have things from our past that we need to be set free from. We all have things in our past, wounds, uh, unmet expectations, things that have gone on in our past that we need God to heal in order for us to move forward into our purpose and destiny. And that's the third part right here. Discover purpose. You and I are an important part. Believe it or not, you and I are an important part of God's plan on the earth. And you have a calling, you have a destiny, you have something that God has wired you to do. And God will always be leading you forward into that in order that you'll move into this last place right here, that you will make a difference. That you will make a difference in in this church, you will make a difference in our community, you will make a difference in our city, in our nation. Think about it. And this is, this is the, the message that I want to share with you today about this is God's ultimate plan for your life. Think about it because to, it is to make a difference in the lives of others. When, when your life intersects with another life and makes a positive eternal difference, that is what God wants. And you want to talk about filling this fulfillment of fulfillment In your life, when God uses you to touch the life of somebody else in a positive way, there is nothing more fulfilling than that. And God calls each of us to make a difference. Now, if you're here and you're just checking out our church and you're wondering, what's this church all about? What's this pastor all about? I got to tell you up front, I have an agenda. Okay, I just want to let you know up front, I do have an agenda. Okay, and and here it is. I want to lead you to experience every single one of those. I want to lead people to know God. I want to lead people to find freedom. I want to lead people to discover their purpose and to make a difference. This is our heart as a church. This is our this is my heart as a pastor. This is God's heart for each of his People. So I want us to focus on this idea, if you'll bear with me and bear with my voice for just a few minutes, this idea that I can make a difference. You can make a difference. So I want you to just say that with me. I can make a difference. All right, say it like you mean it, like you've had your coffee already. I can make a difference. Okay, throughout history, the church has been marked by difference makers. Difference makers, people who were 100% sold out to God and refused to shrink back. They refused to give up. They refused to shut up. They refused 
to compromise what they believed. The history is full of people like that. Like Noah built the ark. Thank you, sir. Nehemiah built that wall. <clears throat> Trump's working on one too, right? Okay. David slayed Goliath. <laughs> Don't take that too far. Don't be distracted, okay? Uh, Peter, Peter dusted himself off and helped establish and build the church. Jesus Christ, God's one and only begotten Son, absolutely changed the world. If there was a difference maker that ever existed, it was Him. Amen. Generation by generation, the church of Jesus Christ has been built by everyday, ordinary people who were absolutely sold out to God, yielded and surrendered to Him. They were filled with His Spirit, and they were difference makers, young and old, kids in the room, teenagers in the room, you guys listening on YouTube, I want you to know it doesn't matter how young or how old you are. If you are sold out to God, He will take your life and He will use it to make a difference in the lives of other people. <clears throat> I didn't used to, to be this way, to feel this way, but now, more than anything else in the world, I want to make a difference for my God. I want God to use me. And I want God, I want to serve God's purpose in my generation. In fact, at my at my funeral, I have a request. Okay? If if we have a pastor here who happens to preach my funeral, whenever that may be, I have want a request. I want the pastor to be able to say this verse in Acts about me. Look at what it says about David. He says, For when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. Man, there is no, I want nothing more than when my time is over on this earth for that preacher and all of you to be able to say, For when Brian served, for when Brian served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. Wouldn't that be amazing for someone to say that about you? Did you serve God's purpose? Because I believe if we truly surrender ourselves to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, Jesus will take our lives just as we are. He will heal us. He will shape us. He will forgive us. And He will use our lives for His purposes. And He will cause us to become spirit-filled, devil-chasing, difference-makers on this earth. Number one is this. I want you to jot this down. You can make a difference for in those closest to you. For those closest to me. <clears throat> Look at Acts chapter 16, verse 31. It says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. And look at this little tag at the end. You and your household. Now, that doesn't mean I don't believe that once you are saved, that automatically saves all those in your household. But it does mean this, that because God has saved you, you will then be so influential in your own household. I experienced this in my own life. For I wasn't raised in church, and God radically got my attention at the age of 17. He brought me into his church. He saved my life. And you know what? I was the only one to go to church for the longest time. And my prayer was, God, I've experienced this goodness. I've experienced your freedom, your love. And I want those closest to me to know you just like I know you. And that's been my prayer. And even in today, I just like to think that my life has been used in some small way to influence even my, my, my family. My mom, my dad, my little brother, and my dogs. Hello, somebody. So God can use us to minister to those who are closest to us. <clears throat> Church, <clears throat> God can take the little things. And he can use them and turn them big. He can take just one person and he can make a difference in the lives of countless others. Because one person decided, I'm going to be sold out to God. I'm going to be surrendered to him. I'm going to give him everything. 
And when you're sold out to God, it's amazing what the difference that he can make through your life. The second thing is this. You can make a difference for your generation. <clears throat> you can make a difference for your generation. If you've looked around at all recently, you know that we're living in an increasingly fractured and confusing and evil and sinful generation. And the next generation of people, our, our kids, our teenagers, need active role models in each of their lives. Not just to tell them, but to show them how to honor God. How to honor God with their sexuality. How to honor God with their, with their money, with their time, with their work, with their relationships. They need godly Role models more than ever before in church, we have an opportunity to make a difference as we invest into our kids and as we invest into our students. When we disciple them, when we serve in the kids' springs, when we serve start serving our students, when we love them, when we pray for them, I cannot think of a better place to invest than our kids and our students. Now we can also make a difference in this, in, in this world when we take an active role in our communities. Okay? I want you to think about this. Because instead of just complaining about what's going on in our world. What's happening in our community. What's happening in our government. Why don't we choose to do something about it? Instead of, we, instead of just sitting back and criticize. Why don't we just decide, hey, I'm going to get involved. I'm going to stand up and I'm going to let my voice be heard. You see, we can complain about the problems in our communities or we can volunteer to help and do something about them. We can lament and we can shake our heads about what's going on in our government or we can take an active role and we can say, hey, I'm going to register myself to vote. <laughs> I'm going to go and I'm going to cast my vote according to my biblical values and I'm going to pray for my leaders every single day. So you can either make a point or you can make a difference. But you cannot do both. You see, you can make a point even on social media. Hello, I love you. You love me, don't you? Okay, you can make a point on social media or you can make a difference in real life. It's up to you. <clears throat> Jeremiah 15, 29 says this. Uh, 15, verse 19 says, You are to influence them. Your culture. Your world. Do not let them influence you. We can make a difference in this generation. Also this. I can make a difference for God. Okay? Jot that down if you're taking notes. I can make a difference for God, one godly man, one godly woman can make a dramatic difference even in the darkest of circumstances. The truth is you might be the only Christian in your family or the only Christian in your workplace or the only Christian in your classroom or the only Christian in your neighborhood. In fact, if that's the case for you, you may be so uncomfortable, you're trying to get yourself out of that situation. But perhaps have you thought about this, that the Lord himself may have strategically placed you there to be an influencer. To influence your coworkers, to influence your classroom, to influence people in a godly direction. God can use just one man. Just one woman who's completely sold out to him. He can use you in powerful, life-changing ways. God can do a lot with just a little. He can do a lot with just a little. Look at Second Chronicles 16. Look at this. This is powerful. It says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. Why? To show himself strong. On behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. You see, God is looking for people who has, has a heart after him. And if you have a heart after him, God is going to take that heart and he's going to show himself strong 
through your life. He's looking to do that. He's wanting, desiring to do that. And he's calling out to each one of us and he's asking us, will you be a difference maker? Will you make a difference in those closest to you? Will you make a difference in your generation? And the Lord is asking us today, will you just make a difference for me? Will you join me in what I'm doing? So why don't people make a, make a difference for God? Why don't people surrender themselves to the use of the Almighty God? I think a lot of it has to do with fear. A lot of it has to do with fear. And all throughout the Bible, God is looking for people who he can use to make a difference through. Look at this in uh, Ezekiel chapter 22. It says, I looked for a man. This is the Lord. I looked for a man or a woman among them who would build up the wall. That's another Donald Trump verse. There you go. And stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so I would not have to destroy it. But guess what? The Lord said, I found none. I found none. I looked everywhere for someone just to say yes to me. I looked everywhere, but no one raised their hand and no one volunteered to to be used of me. And why? Why, 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 why? I think the number one answer is fear. Think, Think about this. Number one, jot this down. Number one is afraid of the past. I don't just don't mean the past. I mean your past. You're afraid of the past. It's, it goes something like this. Oh, come on, serve with us on the dream team. It's going to be a lot of fun. You're going to have lots of opportunities. Well, I'd love to, but guess what? You don't know my resume. You don't know the things that I've done. You don't know the things that, that you don't know how many marriages I have. You have no idea. But listen to me. i got to tell you this. Because when Jesus was building a team, he didn't go to the religious people and all all the people who thought they had it all together, the perfect people. No, he went to the everyday common people. And he said, I can take you and I can do something amazing with you. God knows your past. And what he will do, he will heal your past, he will forgive you, and he will shape you, and he will use your life for his glory. Your past, listen to me, your past does not disqualify you. In fact, it probably qualifies you all the more. Because who would a hurting person want to hear from? Somebody who's never been through anything or somebody who has been through it and is just on the other side of it now. God can use you. You're an everyday, ordinary person who's sold out to him no matter what you've been through. It says this in Romans 11, 29. God's gifts, how he's wired the giftings that he's given you and God's call are under full Warranty never canceled and never rescinded. In other words, there is nothing that you can do to disqualify yourself from being used by God. Ask God to take you, and he'll take you just as you are. Ask him to heal you, and he'll heal you just right where you are. And ask him to use you, to forgive you, and he is faithful and just to do that. Somebody say amen to that. Well, I want, to, I want to give you this statement right here. If you want to be a dip, difference maker, this is up on the screen, you have to let go of the past so it can let go of you. You're going to have to. You're going to have to let God help you with the past. And for some of you, it's going to be, you're going to have to step away from your past in order to step into your destiny and step into your purpose. Number, number two is this. We're, we're afraid of the crowd. We're, 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 some of us are afraid of what people think way too much. Some of us won't even pray in public at a restaurant. We're looking around and, oh, is anybody going to see us? No, we need to be bold. Amen. We need to say, we believe in God. We're going to stand for what is right and we're going to stand boldly up for our God. Christians seem to be intimidated these days, and the world seems to be louder and prouder than ever. It's time for us to stand up for God and be bold for Him. Proverbs 29, verse 25 says, The fear of man will prove to be a snare. 
But whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. Do not be ashamed of your God. No, you don't have to be uh, all crazy and weird and goofy and all this. No, but, but you don't need to shrink back. And you don't need to be silent to stand up for what you believe in. I, for one, and I believe many of us in this room, we are just going to make a decision not to be afraid anymore of the crowd. We're going to stand up for God and we're going to let our voices be heard. I, I, I want to encourage you this. When we, when we come in to our time of praise and worship, boy, I don't, I, some of you like really feel it. You're feeling it. You're like, I want to worship God today. I want to praise Him because of everything that He's done for me and everything that He has forgiven me and healed me. He's done all these amazing things. But, but we just kind of sit there all quiet. Oh, what if somebody notices me? What if, what if I get too loud? What if I sing too loud? What if I, what if I raise my hands a little bit too, too high or too long? No, come on. Let it loose. God's done some amazing things, and he's worthy of your praise. Nobody's watching you anyway. We're watching God. <laughs> come on. <laughs> Jot this down if you're taking notes. If, if you want to be a difference maker, my friends, we've got to be more concerned about obeying God than looking foolish. We, it's got to be about listening to his voice and doing what he says, no matter how foolish it may make us seem. Number three is this. We're afraid of taking that first step. Man, have you ever noticed the first step is often the most difficult once you take that first step, it's a little bit easier. It's kind of like getting into a pool, right? You, you would stick your foot in there and be like, oh, it's a little bit cold. And like my wife, Ashley, does she gets in there so, so slowly, and it gets up there. It gets up there, oh, you know, and it just, it's just a hard thing. But come on, like um, my dad always told me, there's only one way to get used to it, and it's jump in. You got to jump in, both feet. Dive on in. It's like a leap of faith. And somebody needs to hear that this morning. You need to take the risk. You need to take the risk. And you need to activate your faith. It says this in Romans, I mean, Hebrews 11, verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. If you want to be a difference maker... For God, you have to step out in order to find out. You got to take the risk. You got to step out to find out. Number four is this, and I'll close with this. This is just, we're afraid of, to fail. We're afraid of failure. <clears throat> in the early 1900s, there was a 16 year old man named William Whiting Borden. He graduated from the school, the Hill School in Pottstown, Pennsylvania, which was a prestigious boarding school known for sending its alumni to Princeton University. He was an heir to the Borden Family Mining Company. And he had a, his family had a fortune, and he had a clear path to wealth and success set before him. But before Borden began his Ivy League education at Yale University, his parents sent him on a year-long trip to travel around the world as a graduation president. Uh, present. <clears throat> Earlier in his life, Borden had come to Christ through the ministry of D.L. Moody. And while traveling around the world, something happened to him that no one expected. As Borden crisscrossed through all these countries like Japan and India and Syria and others, he was moved by the spiritual and physical needs of the people in that, that he encountered during that trip. And Borden wrote a letter to his parents and informed his parents that he wanted to spend the remainder of his life as a missionary instead of a businessman making a fortune. And upon hearing the news... One of his friends remarked that becoming a missionary would be tantamount to just throwing your life away. It would be worth nothing. And upon his return, Borden 
went to Yale and he graduated and he then studied and, and graduated from Princeton Theological Seminary. And when his ministry preparation was complete, he boarded a ship to Asia to serve among the Muslims in the nation of China. <clears throat> And along the way, he stopped in Cairo so that he could learn Arabic and study Islam. In Egypt, listen, Borden contracted spinal meningitis, and less than a month later, he was dead. Only 25 years old, this young man. And when the word of Borden's death reached the U.S., the news made national headlines. One of his biographers described the, the impact of the news as a wave of sorrow that swept across the world. You see, Borden had walked away from fortune to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to the nations of this world. And most regarded his death as a tragedy. However, God took the tragedy and did something far greater than Borden could have ever done in his life as a missionary to China. When, when young men and young women read about Borden's story in the newspaper in America, it inspired them. It inspired them to leave all that they had and to give their lives to reach the nation's For the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it is rumored that at key points along Borden's life. He wrote a series of phrases in his Bible. While he struggled with his desire to become a missionary. Against his father's wishes. And with his father's heavy disapproval. He wrote in his Bible. No reserves. No reserves. In in, in other words. I'm committed to giving it all. I am holding nothing back from God. And toward the end of his time at Yale, where he had started a Bible study that that a lot of the school population attended, he wrote the words, no retreats. He said, I'm not shrinking back. I'm not going back. I'm not giving up. No retreats. Retreats, And as he lay dying of spinal meningitis in Cairo, he wrote the words, no regrets. No regrets. At at a surface level, his life and his death may seem like an unfortunate mistake. And some people may even call it a waste. But God had other plans. Think about this. God used Borden's life. And his death to call thousands and thousands of young men and young women who had, who, who had given their lives to reach the nations with the gospel. And here's the point. God did greater things through Borden's story than, he, than Borden may have ever done with his life in China. Church, too many of us play it Way too safe. We play it way too safe in our Christian life. And we tend to retreat from things that are hard. And we, treat, we tend to go away from and avoid things that are just a little bit unpleasant. But let me ask you a question today. How will you choose to live? How will you choose to live? And I want to challenge all of us to live like William Borden. To be a difference maker for God with no reserves and no retreat and no regrets. Friends, don't hold back. Don't choose the easy path and don't succumb to fear. Letting fear stop you. You do not have to be afraid. Fear does not call the shots. The Bible says God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love And a sound mind. And here's a a scripture I want you to to leave with. And I'm just going to invite everyone to stand as I read this. Come on up, Eric. As we go, as we go further into our vision, God's vision as a church, as God leads you on into your purpose and your destiny, Here's what you need to know, and this is the promise of Jesus Christ himself. 
Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. And it says this, you can be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Will you be a difference maker for God? Will you, will you refuse to let fear hold you back? If you will, I just want you to raise your hand up to the Lord and say, yes, Lord, I'm yours. Yes, Lord, if you're looking for somebody to use, you can use me. If you need somebody to do something, you can use me, God. I'm yours. I'm available to you. Whatever you want me to do, let me know and I'll do it. If you want me to say something, if you want me to extend forgiveness, if you want me to serve somewhere and somehow, I'm yours, God. My answer is yes. You can put your hands down. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your word today. We thank you that you desire to use us in our lives for your glory. And I pray today for all of us who raised our hands. I pray today, Father, that you would use our lives to make a huge difference in our church, in our community, even in our nation and world. And God, do not let fear stand in the way. And when fear tries to raise its ugly head, I pray, Lord, that you would strengthen us to overcome the enemy with the word of God and in the power of the Holy Spirit. We will not succumb to fear. We will not let fear call the shots. But we will only submit to the lordship of Jesus Christ and him only. It's in Jesus' name we pray together. And everybody said, amen. God bless you. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning.